I think we're ready, guys. Oh, amazing. Finally. Hello, everyone. That's amazing to be here. Today, let's talk about Java architecture, the Deploy 5, Deploy Friday episode number 12. I'm here with Adam Bean and also Jen. Hello, guys. Nice to be here with you. And for sure, my colleague, good friend from Florida, Chad Carlson. Hi, Rod. Hello, Chad. So first, please, let's introduce yourself. Jane, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. My name is Jane. I live in New York City. I work for a bank up here, and I volunteer at Code Ranch and with a robotics team. On my job, I am the co-tech lead on a DevOps team, and before that, I was the tech lead and architect on a business app team. Oh, I'm glad to stay with you here. So Adam, please introduce yourself. Ah, now I know from where I know you, Gene. And the last time I saw you, you were inside a banana. Yes, the server side, long time ago. Yeah, server side conference. I know you from somewhere, and this was the server side conference. And there was the um, also the guru guy from uh, from Code Ranch, right? Was also yeah. there. And uh, surprisingly, he he had a talk about m gardens or something like this. Nothing, yeah. nothing about Java. It was just about gardening. And I was completely confused. Like, what's going on here? I was like, something will happen with Java. And I was about gardening. So this is what I remember. This is why, OK, perfect. Yeah, you have um, a good memory. The owner of Code Ranch is Paul Whedon. And he also owns Rich Soil, which is a permaculture site, which is why I was talking about that. Ah, OK. And he gave us all these giant inflatable bananas to carry around. So yeah, we exactly. can find the Code Ranch moderators. Cool. But this was the very last the server side conference, right? We attended. It yeah, it was a nice conference, but it's over. So it was even before the pandemic. So okay, um, hello, Adam here, and I'm 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 freelance and I'm working with Java from from the beginning, um, and still really enjoying it. So um, usually, usually at the back end with uh, Jakarta, Java, MicroProfile, and uh, and front end, I did lots of Java fix and Swing back then, and now front end I do a little bit of JavaScript. Oh, also, you're going to talk about what is Java architecture. Let's first, to our guests, define what is architecture to you. What do you think about architecture? Jean, please go ahead. And architecture feels a little like a vocabulary word because it means so many different things to different people. But to me, it feels like the high level. What are you going to put together so that things make sense? Um, similarly, you don't want every application you have to be different. That makes it hard to work on anything. Um, architecture also includes the non-functional requ requirements. If my app works but takes a year to get back to you, it's useless. So I think all of those things together. And then I think you also get into levels of architecture, you know, application architecture versus enterprise architecture and the high level versus low levelness of it. I'm curious to see what everyone else has to say since I got to go first. Chad, you, you are quiet, so go ahead. I'm really uh, glad to be part of the conversation. For me, I don't have a whole lot of experience in Java myself. I came into this company with a lot of Python and Node and maybe a little Go experience. And my Java interactions have been a lot of uh, kind of sitting over Octavio's shoulders, reviewing uh, his code and the templates that he's put together in our documentation. So I mean, so okay. for the architecture and the Java context, I'm, I'm interested to hear your, your response. Um, I was already curious who you actually are before the show. So can you could introduce yourself what your role is actually and sure. why you're Yeah, I'm on the developer relations team with Octavio. So I help maintain our documentation and uh, put together the Hugo site that it runs on. Um, most of the focus that I have in terms of doing our templates and supporting libraries do mostly focus on Python, Node.js, and Golang in you know the most recent months. Um, and I do a lot of stuff like this, presenting some of the cool stuff that our team is working on and new releases for our company. And I'm just interested, what's about, can you just summarize what plat Platform SH actually is? Because I saw in the invitation, pl Platform SH, it's a cool name, but um, what is it? Just, I'm curious. If possible. Sure. We're a platform as a service provider. So we give you a pretty 
uh, flexible configuration set for deploying your applications and a set of, a set of DevOps uh, tools within uh, this platform to set aside individual development environments, set apart for each pull request or branch that you may be working on to run your whole testing suite during your build hook and really have this picture of your final build application in these individual development environments so that you can sort of with the name of this pod of this webcast of a lot of the stuff that we put out, you have a final built application on a development environment that really just gets moved over to master. So you can feel confident that even on a Friday, you could really deploy because you've gone through your whole build cycle on each one of these environments that you're working on a new feature on. Um, that's so is something like Jenkins on steroids, something like this for me as Java developer. I think that you could say that, yeah, we provide a lot of that same functionality, but within yeah. sort of uh, a hosting uh, attached yeah. to it and a lot of additional tools that we can, you know, sort of provide alongside of that. Jenkins is a service on steroids. Something like this, yeah. just, just because I'm a Java developer, just to understanding what, what, what's happening. So I have a Java service and I push it to your service and then you will pick it up. There is a webhook and just builds everything and deploys, right? Something like this? Yes, yeah, sir. something like that. Basically, you have three files. One, one should just define your application. Like if you are using Maven, if you are using Gradle, you yeah. can put your command to to build your application and then one command to say how you want to run your application. So if you are using like something like Uberjar, you yeah. can run the MVN clean package to build your application. And at the end, you can put the the Java slash jar, your Java file name, something like that. And we have support to several services. So if you want to, you can run your Jakarta application with PostgreSQL, okay. with MongoDB, MariaDB, MySQLDB. And one important thing is we get that credential information through environments. So okay. if you are a happy user from MicroProfile or Spring, if you want to, you can just read that information on production. So you can have like some properties file to run locally. Mm -hmm. And on production, you can run through the environments from this operation. Okay, so it's like your competitor is like Amazon Beanstalk or something like this. So more like that. So, like, you know, you, you push something is prepared environment and they will just start and do something, right? Yes, Hiroko. Or, or Hiroku, maybe. Hiroku, okay. Yes, no, I got exactly. it. I just wanted to see, you know, what the environment is. Otherwise, uh, I, I, I cannot talk with chat because I have no idea what you are doing. Okay, um, the, uh, the, the architecture for me is, is uh, in Java is particular, somehow a dangerous word because um, in project mentions architecture too often, it is usually in Europe, at least, completely over-engineered. As the developers, some developers really love architecture, and they just you know talking with layers, slides, and stuff, which doesn't really matter. But I think what's uh, really helpful is um, as architect. I, I would say what what Gene said. I'm I'm with you. Um, I, I, I don't call it architecture because stuff like this happens. You know, like you know UML diagrams, whatever. But uh, we need some order, order or what for me the architecture is self-constraining. I say, okay, we do this just this like that, and this basically it. And why we do this is just you know to uh, to prevent too many variations. Otherwise, it is chaos. If everyone would like to do you know whatever she or he likes, then uh, so like polyglot programming, whatever. This this I mean this is not fun in larger project, and. Um, and uh, the uh, enterprise architecture, or I don't even know how to call it, like pro project-specific architecture could be useful. What I see there is some, someone with business knowledge or domain knowledge knows, you know, how these systems operate. So it will help me, you know, as developer to tell, okay, if you call this system, uh, it is asynchronous call and this system is synchronous call. And we have transactions here, but th there are no transactions, so we have a different pattern. So this is like more pragmatic architecture, like you know, uh, a larger overview. This is what I would see as architecture. But I don't think we need a lot of architecture in Java projects because if you are reasonable, 
it just happens. You know, you write simple code and 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 it works. So I think also architecture provides a set of reasonable defaults. When Adam said about doing whatever you want, that yeah. reminded me. Uh, there are a lot of companies that have you know maybe fifty web apps. You don't need all fifty of them done in different ways. Like yeah. this is the way we do web apps here. And if you want to do it differently, you have to have a reason. It's like, oh, well, in this particular application, we think we should do X, Y, and Z, and here's why. But it doesn't just become, well, we're going to use X because we did it at my last job. And then on the other app, we're going to use Y because we did it at my last job. And, you know, well, behold, the person who has to maintain all that. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, so what you so said, the, the reasonable defaults, what Jean just said, uh, for me, it's just important to know why we the defaults have. So I'm, I'm involved in larger companies and some, some rules are just not logical, but no, no one tells why. So for me, it's not just about the rule. We should know why, because it's political decision. We have to you know to use it because of licenses or whatever. And sometimes if it's not apparent why someone decided what, this will, this will never fly. Yeah, I agree. And the, knowing why behind the reasonable defaults lets you know, does this make sense to be an exception that, okay, well, we think we should do this differently. If the reason is, oh, well, we chose this a long time ago because of this and it doesn't apply, that's great. If the reason is three weeks ago, the head of architecture said that to use why, like, you know, this seems like something that's not a battle worth fighting. Yeah. We yeah, interrupted yeah. the problem. Mm -hmm. No, 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 it's no problem about that. That's a conversation. It must be this way. Uh, beyond that, usually the architect is the guy or the person who takes the decision to choose technology to use on production environment. At least that usually happens here in Brazil. The okay. architect is the guy who, okay, let's use that language, language, let's use that framework. And based on that, I have one question to you guys. Uh, a lot of language coming, so, a lot of a lot of frameworks coming so we have node.js to have go and java is too popular because two verb verbs in some topics something like that why do you think java is too relevant to modern modern application well first of all java changes frequently so it's not fair to say that it's verbose based on something that happened a long time ago but there are a lot of JVM languages, so you can do scripting, you can do Scala, you can do Clojure, you can do a lot of things within the Java ecosystem, and you can take advantage of all the libraries that already exist. A company of any size has, you know, easily 100 in-house jar files that you can reuse to do things, and if you're the person who says, well, in this project, we're going to use Go, like, that's great. Now you have to re-implement all of these things in order to be secure and to develop efficiently, which project eats that cost. So I think changing to a new language is something that needs to be done more holistically and not just an architect on a given project. And even worse, what Jean uh, said, what, uh, what I see in larger company, which causes a lot of trouble, that the project is often developed by external developers like me and uh, then maintained by different uh, external developers also like me. And the companies which take over the project are not uh, necessarily happy with the decisions made by the architect before. And this causes a lot of trouble and lots of money gets burned, at least in Europe. And I have no, no uh, experience with USA. Uh, but um, this is, um, this is uh, what I see. And if you, you know, uh, if you, if you, what you can achieve is with the self-constraining, if you focus just on the absolute standards. So if let's say we just take Java, so uh, then the entire discussion is over, you know, why we didn't choose, let's say, Clojure. Because, you know, Java is programming language, language still number one or close to, to number one. And this was the decision, just reasonable decision. But if I will lose the path and say, okay, um, I, and instead of using, you know, Java, I will just decide to, to use a an, an more esoteric language. I don't like to, to mention any languages because it's always uh, problematic, but let's say something not Java, then I will have to, constantly justify why I did this. And then we get now 10 meetings just discussing which programming language to choose, which from customer perspective is completely irrelevant. And about verbosity, I don't think that if you, if you, if you are a Java developer, just with plain, I mean, Java programming language developer, and you are reasonable, you will lose a lot of time uh, if you, if you comp choose to use Java instead, let's say Python, Go, Scala, whatever. There are, of course, those as particular choices, like I'm, I'm 
building a game or, uh, or um, I don't know, AI or something like this, you can have some gains, but usually Java is fine. Yeah, and that turns into what libraries exist, because the reason yeah. you might choose Python over Java is not that you have less keystrokes to write a for loop. It's you want yeah. to use library and it's far mm -hmm. superior in Python. Yeah. Uh, you know, as developers, we are not constrained by the number of keys we type per second. We're not typing. Yeah, you, you say this, but uh, this is what, what not what, uh, what people at conferences are talking. You know, Java is verbose, as unproductive, which is absolutely not true. Yeah, and I think yeah. it could be better. And we've seen that a lot with the recent language improvements because you do yeah. want your tool to keep getting more efficient. The same thing with our IDEs, whether you're using IntelliJ or Clips or whatever, you want to use it productively. You know, yeah. I can generate my getters and setters in three seconds. It doesn't matter how verbose they are because I didn't type them, right? Exactly. So there's definitely something to the verbosity thing, but I don't think it's the reason to choose a language. I think it's the ecosystem that makes you choose your yeah. language. And I think the verbosity of Java was solved with Java 8, I would say, right? Since Java 8, we are fine. So it's getting better and better, but Java 8 with the streams and lambdas actually solved a lot of problems. And that wasn't about verbosity. That was about a way of thinking that we can now yeah. do things functionally. We don't have to write all of this code to do it. Yeah, the, the, uh, you know, nested for loops were not, uh, there was a huge amount of code. So I did the difference between uh, nested for loops and, and, and streams, Java 8 streams are huge actually. So this is what I see, right? If you are in finance and you have to do lots of averaging or whatever, then there's a, a huge difference between Java 8 and, and Java 7. And on architecture with the languages, I think it's reasonable for a company to provide a small set of choices, right? If you're doing a web app here, you use Java. If you're doing a SharePoint app here, you use um, C Sharp or whatever, um, right? Yeah. But, but not, oh, well, there's a new project. What language shall we use? You know, start yeah. from one place. And then if you think you need to add another language for that pile, explain why. Yeah. And uh, I was in the role of architect several times. And uh, what I did is I, um, I, did, I never prescribed something and say, okay, this is uh, what I suggest. And you have different ideas, just let's talk about that. And if you do this this way, <laughs> they will just take your idea and go. But you say, you have to do this, forget it. So you get, you know, immediately emails, escalation meetings or whatever. So I think it is uh, really important just to suggest things and not, you know, to say, this is the absolute rule because nothing is absolute in software development, not even architecture. You always have exceptions. This is, I think, the most important thing. And uh, I don't know what your opinion is, Gene, but um, in, in projects, when I hear someone being very dogmatic, it usually is already a bad sign. Everything which is dogmatic in software development, you know, always do this, always costs a lot of money. There are always exceptions. Yeah, and I've got an exception for you. I work for a bank. With security, we are extremely dogmatic about everything. Uh, but it, you know, it's because it's like, you can't say that, well, we're going to just sacrifice security on this project to get it done, right? That's not a thing people do. But in the space of technical decisions, I definitely agree with that statement. Yeah, like for instance, layer, right? So uh, for instance, uh, my, 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 my pet example is like um, DTOs. So some architects prescribe DTOs everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, lots of classes are copied back and forth. But actually, you can use DDO just if you have the problem, not everywhere. And you can save a lot of time, for instance. And this is what, I, what I'm talking about. Of course, security or, uh, you know, a robustness is the same. So you, you will have to have timeouts everywhere, for instance. But this is like a general rule. Yeah, like code has to be compilable, period, right? So, but yeah. Um, about architecture, Otavio. Uh, th then another uh, example from, from, from my world. Um, I, I actually um, talk about it several times, but uh, it was an interesting experience. So um, one client of mine came to me after 10, 10 to, I don't know, 15 years. And we did back, back then uh, uh, the old, um, uh, they migrated from the J2E with XML to the Java E without XML in annotations. And they asked me, you know, what to do. And uh, what we did, uh, we, we fully focused on the business and uh, didn't, you know, use any frameworks, whatever, just plain uh, Java 5 and uh, 10 years later they came to me and say um, this was actually the coolest decision ever because there were other de departments in the company and they tried everything you know all languages and and frameworks and most they tried it died so they had to migrate to something else and they just focus on business logic and I almost forgot about the Java 5 and now after 10 years we just deleted more interfaces and annotations and now our backing game you know with really nice uh, Pojo-based architecture. And this is also, I think, uh, a good way of thinking is um, just ignore a little bit the whole, you know, the entire fashion and, 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 and focus, on, on, focus on, uh, on business. 
and then take as, as little as possible of technology. The less dependent you are on external infrastructure, the more stable the platform is. And this is, I think, how, why Java is so successful, because the companies have real trust in Java. They say, okay, we never broken uh, anything. And this is why now we you know we get the hysteria about Jakarta in namespace, because the first time they will change the packages after 20 years and uh, say, okay, this is a big deal and Java is not compatible anymore. Yet this is once in 20 years, which is absolute healthy from my perspective. Yeah, I, I love that example. The fact that nothing ever breaks has trained us that it shouldn't. Whereas yeah. in some other languages, it's like, okay, there's a new version number, change everything. And people are like, oh, okay. But we have yeah. so much of a history of not doing that. It's like, wait, my code's not going to compile? Wait. Yeah. I think during we are speaking, Chet already, you know, has to pull pull down the entire NPM repository because his code already is broken, right, Chet? I would. It's, it's a constant thing of doing that, trying to update one little thing, one little release, and everything. Yeah. What I'm really doing, for instance, uh, with uh, uh, JavaScript, some of my clients ask me about the opinion of Node.js and so forth. Uh, Node.js, not that much anymore, but Angular, let's say, or front-end mm -hmm. frameworks. And if I explain them how, how, how fast they are moving, they are losing the interest. It's like we are really not interested in maintaining the entire time the infrastructure. This is the, this is the feedback, which is uh, also interesting. And you I mentioned Go. I really you, like you, Oracle dealt with the LTS thing that you can upgrade every six months or every three years so that they yeah. can end it faster without the large customers freaking out about there being releases every six months. There's yeah. a separate option of those two release schedules? Well, you, can choose, you can choose to only use LTS releases, which right. effectively okay. means you're upgrading every three months, or right. you can choose to be on the latest, which effectively means you're migrating every six years, every, sorry, every six months. Or you could do something random. You could be like, I'm going to go every other version. I don't know. It's something that, yes. looks, that looks like Ubuntu, right? So Ubuntu, you, you, we have the version LTS mm -hmm. that I'm using right now, by the way. And then we can wait until two years to update again and more two years. Something like that's happened mm -hmm. with Java right now. All right, this is why the streaming didn't work, right, Otavio? This was the fault of your LTS version. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, um, Gene is right. So it it has to be clear to communicated uh, communicated to the to the uh, clients to the customers, and uh, you can choose you know every six months their version and and the long term supported versions. And uh, even I think uh, OpenJDK, if you have um, CentOS, you get just the LDS versions. Anything else you will have to download with curl or wget or something like this. Right, and then Azul has the MTS if you want to upgrade every year and a half. So if you want something in between. Mm -hmm. Okay. So usually in your work, guys, do you just keep the LTS or try something different? How do you handle right now the new Java version? Because in the past, a lot of people complain because wait like three years to release a new version. And right now, a lot of people still complaining because Java has a version every six months. So how do you handle that? We only use LTS versions because paying for security patches and having them supported a long time is important to us. Yeah, and um, I'm, I'm a freelancer, so I'm working with uh, several companies. So if I'm working for a larger company, my first question is, uh, what are you using? What uh, operating system with licenses do you have? And usually I have to use whatever they have. And uh, usually some companies have, you know, um, uh, contracts with Oracle, then we have to use the Oracle JDK. Others have uh, the, um, Azul system Zulu, then we use just Zulu supported version. And um, f f with uh, startups, by the way, lots of startups uh, recently uh, using Java again. And then uh, what we usually do, we, we pick the newest uh, Java, so they have some fun. And uh, in some startups, if they would like to do something really new, we enable even preview features, why not? Because if you are no small project with uh, some microservices, you can lower the risk. You know, you can have one microservice with experimental features, and you can always, you know, migrate down. So um, it really depends. This, uh, this is actually architecture, uh, architectural question: which Java operating system to, to use, or even whether uh, my clients uh, are using supported versions of the runtimes or not. For instance, in one project, we want to have micro profile with Whitefly, and it turns out this was a really critical project, and they had to buy for almost legal reasons, support for the runtime, and they had to use JBoss EAP. And this was all the ver version which not that available microprofile support. So we had to patch, you know, 
the uh, supported uh, JBoss to support MicroProfile, also architectural decision. And I asked them why we have to do this. They said, okay, because for me it was obvious, okay, then let's go, right? So um, yeah, but this is, um, it really depends on my clients. And uh, right now for me, for fun, I'm using Java 14 with enabled uh, previews this is what I'm using right now. We're not thinking about Java 15. And my clients, I'm using Java 11 almost everywhere. Okay. So this is. Mm -hmm. So on my point of view, you, you're right, you guys. Thank you for explaining that to me. But right now we are in the cloud age, right? And basically cloud is, I don't care about something. So if I want to use, yeah, I don't care about hardware anymore, something like that. Usually I go to some kind of abstraction, like platform as age, because that is a pass. And what become more popular right now since last year was the serverless. Mm -hmm. um, back end is a server, whatever you want to say about that. But um, and a lot of people complain because Java is too slow to start up the application, right? So do you think Java is a good choice to use serverless right now? Should I start? Okay. Or Jim, would you like to say something? No, you can go first. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, first, serverless. Uh, it is, uh, I think it's now no more that popular uh, like one or two years ago, because uh, if you think about serverless from the architectural perspective, for me, serverless is like command pattern, right? The input and output and one function like static function is going uh, to be invoked over and over again. And you basically are paying per invocation. So if you have a larger project and we have in some project, you know, several thousand transactions per second, it quickly, uh, if you just do the math, it can happen that the serverless is way too expensive. So it means it is probably reasonable for a smaller project, but if you have a smaller project and you have to implement everything with command pattern, we, we had the trend, I don't know whether Gene remembers, um, like 10 years ago in Java, everything had to be, you know, command pattern because you could replace everything and do a hot mess because uh, then you had, you know, one, uh, um, one command execute with object in, object out. You have to do lots of class instance of no one knew what happens. And, and what I see is if you would implement a large system with lambdas or serverless, I, can, I, I, I cannot see how it can be even possible to, to, to write something complex with it. Having said that, um, if you, there are killer use cases for this, right? If, if your data is already in um, queues on Amazon, let's say, then you can use a serverless function as an integrator, you know, to pick up the data and, and, and forward it to our monolith. This is what, what I would see as serverless. So I think right now, serverless is no more that hot. So at least in my clients, some of my clients just using serverless as integration point, but not like a general programming model because there were too many projects which were either too expensive or too complicated. Yeah, I see serverless used for new things, but in specific use cases. Yeah. Um, something I want to call out with performance is that it's very dependent on what cloud vendor you're using. For example, AWS has for Lambda that you can have configuration. So essentially, you're not doing cold starts all the time, assuming mm -hmm. you run your Lambda reasonably often. Right? If you run your mm -hmm. Lambda once a week, you have a cold start. That's just the way it is. But if you yeah. have it being run continuously, you can configure it so that it's not cold starting every time you run it. And then you hit the benefits of Java, which is that it's faster when it's not a cold start. Yeah. And uh, there is a nice uh, open source project called FN Project from Oracle, so you can play with it. And uh, you can even specify hot functions and they will remain in memory, basic or memory, they will not go down. And uh, with project like Helidon or Quarkus, if you have the native compilation, it starts in tens of milliseconds. So I would even argue, it, I think even should be faster than Node.js start. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Quarkus is as fast that you can even extend Kubernetes with Quarkus. So I think the problem is solved right now. Um, it, it is, it is, I mean, harder to find the killer use cases, uh, for, for, for serverless because, uh, the killer use case would be, you know, you have invoice, you're printing invoices. So you are storing, you know, something as XML, you get PDF back or something like this, but it's not what we usually do. I don't know, Gene, in your, in your, uh, world, but in my case, we have often no servers run and running all the time and all the time something happens. It's not like, you know, one, one, one transaction per day. We have usually several transactions per second. And then it's, from my perspective, serverless uh, less interesting. Yeah, I see the serverless stuff more for the bank as stuff that's not core. So like yeah. you know, with the yeah. chatbot and the utility that grants you certificates and all of that yeah. and plumbing stuff, mm -hmm. but I'm not seeing, hey, let's run our accounting system serverless. That sounds like fun. Yeah. Uh, 
stuff which really doesn't matter, right? So this is for me zone. Therefore, it's just there. We can use it. It's not just that it matters. It's that it's bulk. It's like there's so much stuff and it exists already and it's embedded. We're not building a system from scratch. So it's not, hey, let's reinvent how everything does because it's hard to mm -hmm. tease apart the things that already exist. Mm -hmm. I think if you were at a brand new company, you would have a different outlook on, oh, okay, well, you know, Greenfield, let's figure out what we want to do. And even then, I think some things would be suited for serverless and someone. Oh, I uh, recently, uh, I suggested serverless, and this was perfect use case. This was a publisher, and what they had, the uh, they, the server's running all the time, and uh, why I got the idea, because Chad uh, mentioned Hugo. This is what I what I got the idea. And uh, the uh, the new architecture was the idea that you have uh, some kind of queues like Kafka, and you put content there, and then you have one function which wakes up, uh, takes the content, and creates you no know, PDF, EPUBs, and whatever, and put it somewhere. So if they uh, if uh, someone writes an article or provides content, then uh, the content gets transformed to a different formats by functions, and then you can have one function for a different as translated to a different uh, to to a specific format, for instance, right? Like Kindle format and PDF or whatever, or HTML. This is perfect, but there's no not every company has such use cases. It's not like general purpose programming model, I would say. If serverless is a tool like everything else, it's good to have more yeah. tools. Like message-driven beans 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, you definitely <laughs> wouldn't wanted everything to be an MDB. Yeah. OK, you mentioned something about Quarkus, Helidon, maybe Micronauts. Uh, and now, when I read a lot about Java, I saw the t new term that is micro frameworks. What is a micro framework? To... Is, is Quarkus already a micro framework? Does Quarkus qualify as a micro framework or not? You know, what? a lot of people say that Quarkus is a micro framework, but to be honest, okay. I have no idea about the difference between them. Okay. To me, just a new market term to you know to pop up in the Google search, something like that. I had okay. I had not heard that term before, so I just Googled it, and there's references that go as far back as 2011. So it's interesting that it's a hot term now, but it, it's not new. And even back as far as 2011, it's unclear on what it meant. So people are like, oh, well, it's a small web framework versus a big app, or it's this or it's that. So what does it mean to you? Yeah, what I read about it was, OK, reflection is amazing. However, it's slow to, to become fast in the job world. And the whole idea is to avoid the, the Java reflection use uh, compilation stuff to make the Java the application faster itself. Something like we can do with native one. And I read about Micronaut and also Quark will say something about that. However, on my perspective, maybe I'm so old but I don't feel comfortable to put private, private getter setter to everything, to every entity. Like I have an ID that is all generated. Why should I put a setter for an ID that will be automatically generated by my database? And there's one thing that I uh, still think about it. So should I go to Quarkus, Micronaut, these kind of frameworks that maybe I lost some visibility because it should put almost public in everything? Or should I stay with Jakarta or Spring that I can uh, use uh, something more rich model? OK, um, now I have it. I, I just uh, did some Googling because someone asked me the question already in March about micro frameworks. And uh, this is the, um, there was the AHEX TV and there were two micro frameworks mentioned. One was called Pipo, which is nice. And the other one called Spincast. And I look at them and they were really micro. It's like Pipo is uh, P-I-P-P-O. I just put it to chat, write it down. Can I chat? Pipo. Pipo, oh, Pipo, and then Spincast. So um, funny enough, if you look at Quarkus, 
it's actually white fly repackaged with some uh, you know hotness. So um, Helidon is more had pieces from micro profile in Jersey. So uh, people think that the uh, application servers were big, but they are actually pretty small. And the um, the the Quarkus and Helidon make it even smaller. But the the you know the legacy or the 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 origins of both frameworks are uh, well known Java frameworks like you know Netty, Jersey. Uh, hibernate, uh, hibernate validator, uh, rest easy is not like they, in, they just, you know, programming with the entire framework is one function. So having said that, what the new way for frameworks is, uh, Quarkus or Helidon, especially Quarkus is, what Quarkus did, they look at Whitefly and they saw that uh, Whitefly uh, has the capability to deploy multiple applications at once. And if you deploy multiple applications at once, you have to deal with class loaders, uh, redeployment, you know, directory scanning. And they saw, okay, in the cloud age or microservice age, it is not uh, that important anymore to have uh, multiple deployments, shared deployments on application server. And what Quarkus does, Quarkus optimizes for one deployment. So this is the big difference to Whitefly. So what they do is they read the entire stuff, the configuration, the conventions, whatever they can, you know, uh, learn from the application. They generate the bytecode instead of using reflection. And for me, it's just stock Java or microprofile system. This is the cool stuff. I can take Quarkus, go to any large project, and just say, look, now you can you can save you know 80% of memory, and everyone is happy because they don't have to relearn uh, something new. This is why I not use Micronode uh, in projects because Micronode comes with own programming model. But Helidon and Quarkus, they are very similar to Jakarta E or Microprofile. So you don't have to relearn anything. You can just, you know, basically you can, you can create a standalone Helidon or Quarkus project, move over the POM and make it and, and see whether it works. If you're happy, it is already working, you know? So this is the migration from old Java -y or Jakarta -y world to Quarkus. So therefore I was curious whether you believe that Quarkus is a micro framework. I would say it's probably like next generation runtime. It really is because really next generation, it does everything differently. But a micro would be like the people on Spincast. I took a look at this. They are very radical what they are actually doing. And Helidon in SE, the Helidon comes with two flavors, Java SE and Java micro profile. I think the SE framework will qualify as, as micro framework because there is nothing. You have the main method and you start the thread and you are alive, right? But um, from productivity perspective, why I should do this, right? I would rather to, uh, choose something more complete, at least in the entire micro profile, to be more productive. And uh, because this micro is probably interesting, you know, for Netflix or Facebook or, or Twitter, and it's not like my clients have, you know, the, the, the scalability requirements from YouTube. Productivity and maintainability is more important than saving a view max or reflections, my point. Yeah, that's a good, huge point discussion. And yes, we, we had Burr from Red Hat here, and he said about Quarkus is faster the Node.js and, and Go on production. And he says something about they have several clients who can confirm that. So. I, I, I go, uh, hard to tell. And uh, if it is faster, I don't think it is twice as fast, you know. And if it is 10% faster, who cares? Unless you are you, you, you are Netflix, right? This is, this is, I'm talking from enterprise architecture perspective not from Twitter perspective. Yeah, and another, the model, another domain people care about that is Goldman Sachs. They've presented a number of times at the New York Java SIG about basically they've reinvented Java. They, they can't use large parts of it because of garbage collection and this and that and the other things. They've made Java a lot more like C++, but it's safer. And that's a really interesting compromise, but they're doing it because when you're trading, you do care about those milliseconds and 10% does matter. Yeah, uh, you mentioned trading, right? Trading, right? Yeah, you are right. But this is, um, I never was in a trading project. So for me, it was, uh, it is complete foreign use case. You are from New York. So it's probably, you know, uh, you have more such use cases. Yeah, you are absolutely right. So you will probably look at the 
what was this, you know, the interesting pattern like with the ring buffer, uh, with cool name? You remember the pattern? Like the... Uh, um, I can't think of the name either. There was on the, from UK a pattern where they implement a ring buffer to prevent uh, garbage collection with really cool name. I forgot the then the name was excellent, um, but uh, it was hard to use. But you could prevent you know garbage collector cycles. Right. So the key for, is for that me, what, are specialized domains. They're you know ninety nine percent of people don't have this problem, so you shouldn't exactly use based on it unless you've started with that problem and it's well established. And and my point of view, let's talk about architecture again. Is I would allow developers just write simple code, even if it's suboptimal regarding reflection and and garbage collector. And if the code is simple and is understood by everyone, and the performance is good enough, we would went go to production. And from my perspective, perspective, any optimization of this code is counterproductive because we will have to justify why we are optimizing something which is good enough. Right, prove that it's a performance problem before actually doing yeah. something about it. And yeah. also on a higher level design properly. If your code makes 100 network calls, it doesn't matter how simple the low level code is, the architecture already has a performance problem. Yeah. So, you know, start there. Yeah, and this is why I also, um, I don't know whether who, who I think this is uh, was my invention, but I don't think so. Don't distribute. What I say, if it's possible, don't even go outside. So just implement everything in one JVM, write a monolith, and 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 you are good to go. In the the premature optimization, the, the hood of the all evil. So some yeah. somebody said that say that. It's, and it's, yes, Adam. Uh, sorry, Jean. Go ahead. I was just crediting it. It was from news. Oh, thank you to let me know. You mentioned something really, really important. You mentioned something about put everything together, right? Mm -hmm. but right now, everybody mentions something about microservice mm -hmm. because microservice is to a new, newer architectures, architecture plant is the new silver bullet. And what do you think about that? So should how should I use microservice? When should I use microservice? And the last is why should I use microservice? Yeah, why? That's the reason. If there is no why, no microservice. Right. I so, think why is deploy time, that I can get this part of it done very quickly. I can get these things deployed in isolation from each other. I think performance becomes one of the negatives or trade-offs that you have to make when you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 and why could be, I have, we already know it, right? Separate teams or different release cycles. Right now, um, uh, in a uh, for instance, uh, right now I'm writing a, a new block engine for me actually, and uh, I have in one part I have to use the Graal VM, and but this is not always compatible, so I encapsulated this in a small microservice to to to, to you know not to 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 deal with the incompatibility in the entire system, and the other microservice just you know the bulk of work. So this is my reason why I have two microservices, and uh, and the, this decision is perfect because I'm faster. And um, so you have, or, or monitoring, you know, you have a critical point like trading, let's say, and has to be highly performant. So the, you could have one microservice, which is highly performant and just uh, calls uh, locally. And then other services can call from outside, for instance. And um, yeah, th th there should be a reason. In one project, there was um, uh, monitoring observability. So uh, the, the, uh, the, um, if we had uh, multiple microservices, it was way easier to see what they are actually doing. And um, yeah, but uh, there is no Microsoft service without the why. And, um, and this is the most important thing. And what I see also in, in my world still, like uh, developers are, are shipping, you know, 20, 50, sometimes 100 microservices and they are proud of the achievement. But this is like, you know, we have in our C, uh, PCs, 100 cores and every core is, it has the power of an you know, ZX Spectrum from 1980s. So uh, it is like, um, it is not a reasonable architecture. It doesn't make your code simpler on your previous point of, of there could be some advantage in separating concerns into individual microservices and teams that focus on that. Once you split up to that degree, if the performance level really isn't giving you any real advantage, I would imagine it just makes ma the maintenance of this, of all these teams and these, these yeah. disparate code bases that much more difficult. I don't know if there's a level in which that really becomes the case that, that highlights that first why question. But if you have the, you know, the, the already the teams, then uh, this is Conway's law, then you get the microservices or jars or whatever. 
But uh, what I observe is even in project with one small team, they are just creating microservice without a reason. This is what I don't get. And uh, in Java, what we have, yeah, and on, in Java, what we have, we have, for instance, a tool I use, uh, Maven. And if every team creates a module, which is versioned, what I would at least expect, you know, to have different versions of the module. What sometimes happens, the shipping, uh, you know, 20, 30 microservices to production, and the version is always the same. So um, if something changes, they, they have to rebuild everything, and this doesn't make any sense for me. And if I'm asking them, why are you doing this? I get, you know, the answer because of modularity. So, okay, who pays for modularity? Who cares? I mean, there should be some benefit. And the modularity itself is nothing. You know, it's just empty words, I would say. But you're right. If you already have the teams, it's a completely different story. So we, we know we can encapsulate. We have our API, and I can version independently from you. And, and this is perfect. It will be, it will fly. And even you have some cost of duplication because on the edges, we have to implement, you know, the transfer object twice, but it will pay off. But in one team, you know, creating microservices without obvious reasons, I don't get it. I think it's number of apps too, not just numbers of teams. If you've got one team and they're responsible for 10 apps and there's a lot of overlap, we're back yeah. to their bidding benefits to microservices, even though it happens to be the same team right now. But then I would expect different versions or different release oh, cycles. Absolutely. Yeah, if yeah. you play the whole thing together all the time, you have a monolith yeah. and all the parts. But this is what I see in most, you know, uh, this is like, you know, sickness. You have a multi-module uh, Maven project um, with different repositories, and it's exactly the same version everywhere. And there's one team maintaining everything. And, and, and if something changes, they, uh, they, they ship everything at once. It's okay, this is not how it was. And then, then it's monolith better. Then what I would see is actually merging everything to one module and shipping. Ship it. It's faster. Yes, yeah, simplicity is everything, right? So yes, uh, but the point is, a lot of people are talking about microservice, and I guess some new architectures. Architecture. I yeah. like to put that any kind of that in production. Yeah, but the people talking. It. People talking all the time about everything. So as long as they're doing Java, whatever I did, it was wrong because they told me there's a new stuff. Do this. And this was, you know, the constant, I don't know whether you remember, uh, 20 years ago, there were agents. There should be agent, distributed agents programming. Okay, okay, what they can do, no one knew, but agent had to be there. Then we got portals. Everything had to be portal, you know. So, okay, portal, why we need a portal? And uh, there was huge investment in portals, and at the end of the day, we got, we got you know, menus. Remember OSGI? It was, you know, technology from hell or in the enterprise project, you know, it was like uh, no one knew what the class order is actually doing. We had cycles or not cycles. And, and now it went, what, there was a huge, you know, discussion with Chixo versus, uh, versus OSGI. What happens now? No one talks about Chixo nor OSGI, you know, the problem just disappeared. So what you said is key, just focus, you know, about simplicity and don't have a bad feeling about that. And all of if those you, technologies you mentioned had a use. The problem was when people started saying you should use them everywhere. Yeah, of course. Um, if you OSGI the problem is everywhere future, in like every project, you have this problem. Use it. The, the, you, the, this problem is everywhere. You should use it in your project because everybody has this problem in every use case. Yeah, and the problem is I don't know whether you had, you invited some people from Netflix, but a few years ago, the problem was Netflix and all the you know uh, funky companies needed developers. So what they did, they, pub the, they, they pushed everything open source. They talked at conferences about the cool stuff. And, you know, enterprise developers like me, we watch the conferences that say, I would like to do the same in my project. But the, 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 the problem domain from Netflix and the problem domain from my project is completely different, right? So Netflix is live streaming and my clients not necessarily do live streaming or never uh, stream something live. So, and, and, and therefore we got a project where problems were, they used, Hystrix, for instance, for no reasons. And then Netflix said there is no more Hystrix and the, problem, the project had to migrate from Hystrix to somewhere else because I did, in the first place, there was actually no reasons to use Hystrix in the projects. But um, yeah. So uh, therefore, um, Otavio, what you said, I would say the problem with Java is if you build a system, it is already very simple. And developers, sometimes they, they, they look at the code, at the boring code, and they say, it cannot be that we are already cloud native and everything. Something is missing, right? And they, they, they go to DZone or whatever, and they find you know, reactive programming, or they find asynchronous programming, messaging, or whatever, and they try to improve the code, and, um, which is actually wrong. Because whatever you do, 
you 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 get, you you make your code base more complex, which uh, will cause trouble in a few years because all the, you know frameworks are coming and going, and they, if they come out of fashion, in one point of time, no one will know what OSGI is or uh, Java agents were. Cloud Native is interesting because it has a lot of benefits while being the new vendor lock-in, except it's worse than vendor lock-in because you're at the mercy of the cloud vendor schedule. You can't say, well, we'll just make a copy of the old vendor jar and use it forever. So it's going to be interesting to see what the effects of that are in a few years. Of what? Uh, I missed you at the first uh, word. Vendor lock-in. Uh -huh. I've got a cloud native, I don't know, cloud cloud native, app. Yeah. I can't just be like, well, tomorrow I'll switch to Azure. Yeah. And People don't seem worried about that, yet at the same time, you have companies who are still on struts one because they can't change something. So it's like, so how are you going to manage to change things on the cloud vendor schedule? Yeah. And I was just but saying, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out over the next few years. This That's is problematic. Theory because a lot of people decide to use uh, something like, okay, let's use JBoss, something like that. And when I'd like to move to, I don't know, Glassfish, that you'd be easy. However, it's never happened because sometimes you decide to use something like Jersey, some specific behavior from the implementation itself. It's become harder to migrate the whole code, the whole application through another Java 7 application. So for clouds, for instance, in Java, if you just rely on Kubernetes, it will somehow work. So it's not a big deal. What I see more problem with cloud native is the data. And uh, if I mention this, then then <laughs> the managers, uh, you know, they are start to think about this. For instance, if you are in the cloud, you should consider egress and ingress costs. So if you're pushing your data to the cloud, it's very cheap. Getting your data out of the cloud becomes more and more expensive. And this is, I think, the three, the, the, really the, the, the huge vendor lock-in with that. And if you mention this, and, and uh, in some project, they, they, you know, they started to calculate what it will mean you know, to move out the database from the cloud, and it was really expensive. Yeah, that's a good point. The data is the heart of any kind of application, right? And one important thing that you mentioned, Cloud Native, is everything become a service, right? So we have right now application as a service. We have, for sure, platform as a service. And also, we have backend as a service, serverless, and database as a service. And what do you think about that? Because what I feel is a lot of people is moving to use this couple service because they'd like to reduce the complexity of the code itself to just go to the business. You're also re reducing your infrastructure cost. Um, back, well, this was years ago when we started using database as a service. It was great because it was no longer my job to patch the database, right? So there's lots of benefits to having things in a service. It's a question of where you draw the line. Yeah, and what also happens, larger companies moving from cloud back to their own data centers because it's cheaper. So cloud is not about, uh, it's not necessarily cheaper. Uh, uh, it is someone else manages the cloud. And um, as you can see, uh, there is the, uh, I forgot from Google, the service, um, forgot the name. They have a, a private cloud offering, uh, uh, Google Anthos uh, and uh, Azure Stack and uh, forgot the, the service from, from, from Amazon. So you can actually order cloud which runs in-house. The question is why? Because the companies are really interested in it. And if you think about this, the service is getting cheaper and cheaper. The only thing which is expensive is the, actually the power. So um, over time, public clouds from the, from the commercial perspective sh shouldn't make any sense actually if you think about this. So if you, if you have you know, the software, the cloud software you can run on premise, it should be cheaper. And I know a lot of companies, they rent just servers and they run uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes on servers somewhere, and this is incredibly cheap. Uh, you need the skills, but it's not like you know you can go to the cloud without any skills. You still need you know the skills in the cloud. So I would say, I wouldn't be surprised to see you know a trend in the next few years, moving you know back from public cloud a little bit to private cloud. Of course, they will name it differently, but uh, but something like this. Yeah, but that is a huge risk, right? Because a lot of people mention something like, oh, Kubernetes is amazing. Let's put our database on the Kubernetes. However, nobody mentions something about backup, right? And nobody mentions something about synchronization with the database. Everybody wants to be a Netflix. 
But yeah. there's a huge complexity to handle the whole stuff. And I'm not sure about a, a lot of people moving back to cloud because we when I think about cloud, of course, my perspective is I don't like to handle this kind of stuff and go direct directly to my to my code and my business perspective. I think yeah, but private cloud or public cloud or whatever we're calling private cloud in Adam's future world, that's an accounting thing. It's a cost thing because yeah. the development team is not the one who's maintaining the private cloud. So it becomes, can the group that maintains the private cloud do it more cheaply than Amazon and Microsoft and Google and such, right? And if they can, then it should be private or what, hosted or whatever. And if they can't, they should be using public cloud. Yeah. Because um, what, I, what I'm running on my machine is uh, Minishift, OpenShift, and I used a uh, public cloud, so the command line interface is almost identical. So it actually, this, this OC is actually kubectl, which is absolutely compatible with the AKS tool from, from, from public uh, Microsoft Cloud. So I would say there's almost no difference for me. Of course, I know this load balancing works a little bit differently. And I think the identity management, this would be also a huge lock-in because every cloud provider, they have own identity management. Man management. And if all the users are already in the cloud in the identity management provider, then you have true lock-in. But from Java perspective, it's not as bad, I would say. Is it database is the problem and identity is the problem. Java services, I would say, we are happy with Docker. And if it runs in Docker, we can run it in Kubernetes. And um, yeah, then it works. Okay, we are almost running time. Uh, the last question to you guys is, okay, I'm a student and I'd like to learn to become an architect, so software architect or software developer, a senior software developer. What do you recommend to me? What should I do? What should I watch? What should I you know, buy some books, do some kind of training? Well, first of all, if you're a student, you should learn to be a really good junior developer before you worry about how to become an architect, because if you don't have those skills, you're never going to get there. So how to become a good junior developer, write a lot of code, ask a lot of questions, find a mentor, and continually ask why things happen. A pet peeve of mine is when I ask someone why something is, and they're like, well, because Fred said so. Great, why did Fred say so? You know, because the answer isn't because Fred said so. Fred understood it, and we need to understand it too so we can make decisions based on that. So, you know, don't be that person. Ask and find out why and understand. Continually guess and check and try to get that intuition going. That'll help you become a better senior developer, and that'll be help you become an architect one day down the road. But, you know, don't try to get there too fast. Yeah, I would also say the most important thing is just build stuff. So, and uh, if you are a junior developer and you have no contracts, what you should start with, just, you know, think about your hobby, whatever you have, and then build it. So, and then you can create one system, you know, on-premise, you can go to the cloud. There are free credits for all providers. So you just distribute your service as crazy as possible. Use all, you know, technology. So there's going to be lots of fun. You can do, I don't know what, like, you know, you're running manager with, uh, with uh, whatever. Uh, let's say it's a running app. You would like to have a running app. So what you could already do, you can, you know, have uh, lambdas. You can have um, lambdas which translate your coordinates to, I don't know, some, some locations. Then you can uh, have machine learning, you know, AI for computing your average pulse, whatever. So you just go crazy with that and you will learn a lot. This is what I would do. Um, and, and then you become architect per definition because most of architects actually, I don't know what the situation is in, in, in US, but in Germany. And in one point of time, you cannot know, move up the ladder if you are a developer. So some people are forced to become architects and uh, if you're an architect, you lose a little bit track of what's going on in development. So what can happen is that uh, after shortest amount of, as like after two years, you as a junior developer, you have more experience than the actual architect who forgot actually how to code. Just it varies could happen. By it varies by company. The United States yeah, it varies by company, yeah. And what I know, like that. large companies in Europe where already architects say, we really would like to start coding, but you are not allowed to. And they, they talk with management and now a code again and they were happy, you know? So like coding architect is the best, I would say. Mm. Chad, that's your turn. I guess I'm curious of if we go back to the original uh, a few questions ago about this, this you're making a selection of a 
microservice architecture or like how early is in maybe your answer gene if you're you're coding as much as possible asking as much as questions as possible is the, some of those questions of not just asking people how things work but beginning to get into the to the the reflex and habit of asking yourself that all the time of you're starting in a particular project you're gonna you're gonna gain some momentum in a particular direction of sticking with the model if they're going to the microservice direction early, you kind of got to make that choice so that you can get your head straight. I mean, how, what's, is it just getting the job and, and writing as many projects as possible to get the experience to make that judgment early? Or is there any particular avenue that fits, that's the best for, for exercising that habit, I guess? Learning about other projects too, which is where the mentor helps. Um, yeah. You only work on so many projects, but if you can get exposed to others that you're not working on, you can learn their lessons too. Figure out why they made those large decisions and how early they did. And whether they worked out. Sure. If you're looking at other projects at your company, it's like, oh, this team made that decision. And then six months later, it's like, so it turns out that wasn't a good idea. And now you don't have to go try it. Right. That brings us back to the beginning of this conversation of how much momentum is behind it. We made this decision then we kind of wish we hadn't because now we're making decisions based off that. Okay. Okay. We'll run out of time. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Chad. That was amazing conversation. Deploy Friday. See you next Friday to talk more about software technology. Bye. Bye. Bye.